So you've just bought yourself a Mark II Leon and you've got loads of questions regarding modifying it and also potential issues you might find along the way. So in this video, hopefully I'm going to answer those questions for you. How's it going? I'm Kevin, this North Coast Workshop. We all find content on car modification and DIY. I'm out in the sun for once today, not stuck in the garage. It is 12 degrees, it is a bit windy and cold though still, so not quite exactly taps off weather as they'd say, but still good to get out and sun to be out for once as well. I was actually meant to be a different location today, meant to be, if you can see the cliffs along there in the distance, I'll put a wee drone shot in just now as well. Done at Head, the most normally point in the UK, but they've actually closed that road just the same time I'm trying to go up there to film, they've closed that road to resurface it. So good they're resurfacing because of potholes, but just bad timing that I couldn't get up there just now. So I will get up there at another point. Anyway, today's video, what we're doing is answering the most commonly asked questions when it comes to modifying the Mark II Leon, whether it's down to body kit, styling, interior work, etc. We'll also be mentioning a few of the common issues that you get with this car and hopefully answering that issues as well. I've had loads of help over the years from the Mark II Leon group on Facebook and also just the car community in general. So hopefully now at this video I can give something back to you guys watching this who have questions yourself and hopefully provide those answers as well. I might not be 100% correct, so please, if I am wrong, just correct me down below in the comment section. Not to rub my face in it basically, but just to give the correct information and answers to the people that are watching this video as well. So let's get started with the first question. So firstly, you've got pre-facelift and facelift models. Now, pretty much halfway through the Mark II Leon life cycle, there was a change to this new facelift model, which I've got here with the Cooper R. Now, most of these changes were cosmetic. So first of all, the wing rows are different shape. Also, the headlights at the front of the car were a different shape as well. And therefore, the bumpers had to be a different shape to accommodate this change as well. When it comes to the back of the car, the tailgate was frameless on the new facelift models. And also, the lights that were mounted onto the tailgate were a slightly different shape as well compared to the pre-facelift models. So when it comes to the inside of the car, regarding the facelift models, there were slightly different changes as well. So regarding the clocks, there was a slightly bigger multifunction display on the new facelift models compared to the old ones. Also, the climate controls were slightly different. They had this new gloss back look compared to the old previous version. And then the steering wheel itself, it had a new layout to the steering wheel controls. And also on the FR and Cooper models, you found the steering wheel had a flat bottom on as well for a sport air look. So a few of the easiest differences spot between the facelift and the pre-facelift models would be something like the fog light surrounds on the bumpers. You'll see these are different style compared to the old pre-facelift ones. And you'll notice the crease along the cap for the wing mirror here, which identifies this as the facelift model. And from the rear, definitely the easiest way to spot a facelift compared to pre-facelift is that the facelift will have this frameless boot design as well. So the main thing you want to do is probably fit facelift items to a pre-facelift car. So it can be done. So when it comes to bumpers, you want to do a facelift bumper, you need to do facelift headlights at the same time or else the bumper won't fit with the old style headlights. When it comes to the wing mirrors, you'll need to make sure that you drill an extra hole to fit the bolt that goes through the new facelift wing mirrors compared to the old ones. I think there's a hole that's different compared to the old ones. I've not done it myself, but I've heard that you need to definitely drill something extra to fit these new facelift wing mirrors. And when it comes to tailgate, you can put a new frameless facelift tailgate onto your car, but it's recommended you take the new facelift hinges with you at the same time to make the process a lot easier. And also make sure that you've got new lights to fit on the tailgate itself. The outer ones on the car will be fine as they are, but when you get your new tailgate, make sure it comes with lenses already fitted to it at the same time. And someone would like to add the new textile taillight. Now these can fit, no, no bother, they go straight onto the car, but they might not work immediately until you get them coded in, especially by VCDS or OBD11. So be prepared that if you do buy them, that you've got a bit of work then to actually get into work on the car. And for the things we mentioned earlier on, inside the car, well, the Speedo can get replaced, so you could put a new facelift Speedo in place of the old pre-facelift one, but this will need coding in probably as well. It won't be a straight replacement. You can also put a facelift steering wheel on a pre-facelift car as well. There's a few things you need to add along at the same time to make it all work together. So you need to get a control module box that'll basically make the steering wheel talk to the car itself and also so you can get the multifunction display to work properly and use the buttons on the steering wheel properly. There's also a slip ring, so if you have something like parking sensors and cruise control, this could be quite an expensive piece. The slip ring from my car, because I've got those options on the car itself, it costs about £200 brand new, so be prepared for that as well. And then after all that, you still need to get a code in by VCDS, by a specialist. They'll link up to the computer and get them all to talk together so it works properly. And then finally, your climate controls, which you can then swap over as well, no bother. Again, facelift into pre-facelift, but there's, I think, two wires you've got to swap around. Uh, I'll put a wee screenshot on just now of which wires they are. But you do this, and then it works, no bother, in the car at all. 
So before we go any further, what you can do in this next part here is you can pause it and screenshot these following bits of information. They're just handy things like fuse diagrams, information about the oil specifications for your car, and also bulb part numbers as well. So sadly, this is quite a common issue with these cars where the door locking module inside goes faulty. Now there's quite an easy fix for it, I did a video a while back on it as well, which I'll leave down below in the description if you want to check that out. Basically just involved putting a wee hole in the module, spraying some WD-40 into it, and this fixes it completely. Now three out of my four doors have been fixed like this and they've been worked perfectly as well. The last door over there in the corner hasn't actually gone faulty yet, but I'm waiting for it to happen at some point. So when it does, I'll be trying the same method as well. If you're finding you get a lot of condensation in the mornings inside your windscreen or the rest of the windows in your car, it could be from a few issues. Now check with your hand first to see what footwells are wet, if a footwell is wet. If it's in the bottom front corner of the car somewhere, it could be two issues. It could be the heater matrix or it could be due to the door seals on the car have perished. If the heater matrix has gone, that's an expensive job and quite a painful job to do. The door seals are quite straightforward. Sometimes just get worn and perished and let water in that way. Also, sometimes the door has drain holes in it which get blocked up. And when they get blocked up, the water comes up slightly and into the car. So check them as well. If the footwells at the back of the car or the boot itself are damp, then check a few other things. So the holes might have popped off the rear wash wipe for the car and they'll be squirting water into the boot instead. So check that. Also, the rear light cluster, sometimes the seals in the back of the clusters wear really badly and perish. And this lets water run into the back of the lights and down into the boot as well. So check that. So we've probably got water on top of the engine bay. Now this is probably from one major reason. You will get water running off the bonnet and into the engine bay when you open it. But there's water already sitting there. That's because it's coming through the wee holes for the clips that hold on the plastic trim for the bonnet. Now these can just be siliconed up, we bob a silicon over each clip, there's also a hole right in the centre that can get blocked up as well, so that just makes sure that all the water that is in there runs off to the sides instead and not on top of the engine which can cause damage. So you've had the battery go completely flat on your car for some reason, maybe you had to get a new battery for the car so you take the old one off, put a new one on, you turn the ignition on and you've seen a whole bunch of lights on the dashboard. This is pretty common for these cars, quite easy to fix though. What you can do first of all is actually have the car on, have it running, ticking over and just get the steering wheel and go full lock left, full lock right and do that a few times in both directions. See if that clears it. If that doesn't clear it, take the car for a short test drive. Don't go of any crazy speeds but just go for a short test drive, 5-10 minutes or so and that then should clear most of the lights off the dashboard. If they are still there, because nine times out of 10 this usually clears it. If they are still there, there might be an underlying issue, in which case you should plug in the diagnostic software and get it checked out properly. Now it comes to wheels in this car, I'd say 19s is the maximum size you want to go for. Now 19s come standard in the Cooper R's and they are good looking wheels, but they come with a 35 mil profile tire as well, which is extremely uncomfortable on these roads just now. So ideally the best compromise between comfort and ride and looks is 18 inch wheels with a slightly thicker tyre profile as well. When it comes to designs, you can go for many different designs on this car. A lot do suit the car in general, but I've seen a few like Bentley style ones and also Skoda VRS ones on a couple of cars. I'll put screenshots on just now of them. But you can also go for other ones like from Mark III Leons, you could choose the wheels off them or the Golf GTI Mark VII. So when it comes to tyres for these cars, if you ask say 50 owners what their favourites were, you'd probably get 8% saying it'd be the Eagle F1 Asymmetrics or the PS4s. So on my car just now, I've got Eagle F1 Asymmetrics 5 on the back and I've got 6 on the front. 6 being just a brand new tyre recently out. I have had PS4s in the front before and in my personal opinion, out of all these tyres I've had so far on the car in the past 11 years, the PS4s have felt the best, just for grip when it comes to accelerating hard in first, second and third. As for going around corners, again, it does seem to handle better PS4s on the front in the dry on corners. When it comes to wet weather, I'm not too sure how they all perform differently because if it's wet, I just take a lot easier anyway and don't really push the tyres to their limits. 
but it's up to you have a look online you can also research this yourself to see what other offers there are on other tires i'm not just saying that michelin and goodyear are the only two to go for there are other brands out there that are very good as well but from what i've heard from a lot of owners michelin and ps4 s's are tend to be the best ones so far So when it comes to struts for this car, there's basically a rule for the size and diameter of the struts because you'll get a choice between 50mm and 55mm. So basically all the engines from 1.6s, 1.4s up to 1.9s will be the 50mm struts, whether it's petrol or diesel. If you've then got a 2 litre petrol or a 2 litre diesel, you'll then have the 55mm struts. So this helps when you're looking to choose a new suspension kit for your car and it comes with new struts, you can then make sure you've got the right option selected. And then when it comes to selecting those suspension kits, which ones are the best ones to go for when it comes to either suspension kits or coilovers? Well, check out the following. So you have well-known brands like KW, H&R and Bilstein are all really reliable suspension kits. You also get a Stance Plus for a budget coilover option and EBAC, H&R are most popular for standalone spring kits as well. Just something to be aware of as well, as I found out when I had a B12 kit for my car, it came with springs in the kit that were for about a 25 to 30 mil drop. You can get springs as well in the same kit that drop it by 50 mil, and it's a slightly different part number. So do watch out, it's not just the issue with the diameter of the shock absorber being different between 50 and 55 mil, but also the part number for the springs that come with the kit that will drop the car by different heights. So finally for the exterior of the car we've got LED bulb upgrades front and back. So yeah even wearing the same top just now it's actually a change of day and a change of location. There was some random car that pulled up, two people in it and they just sat basically nearby and watched me film the last part of this video for ages and it was kind of putting me off. So I've now changed location, it's actually a location that I've been before for my suspension video which I'll leave a link down below if you want to see that. And I have also got another visitor with me as well. Say hi Millie. Hi. <laughs> So she's come along with me as well uh, to keep me company. Anyway, let's get back to the video. So next thing up is LED lights for your car. So LED bulbs for the front and for the back of the car. So the best options I would go for is from a place called Little More Lighting. I'll leave a link to his Facebook page down below. And basically he supplies front lights and rear lights, LED bulbs, which are error free. And the ones that sometimes still can't be error free, he supplies also the resistors that will then make sure that light on the dashboard stays completely off. So before you go and buy any cheap versions of eBay or Amazon or anywhere else that promise you they're error free and then they end up not being, I would just go out to Jamie's page, get an order off him. He also does interior lighting sets as well. So all the wee bulbs for the interior, make it nice and clean and bright. So check him out and give him a shout. So the self-opening boot on the Mark II Leon. There's a few ways that you can go about doing this on this car. So I'll show you the way I've got it done on mine. So holding the open boot button on the key fob and it pops open nice and slowly and completely as well. So what I've got on my car is these ones from eBay and they're just basically two struts from eBay made to fit the Mark II Leon and they've got these wee springs on them as well. So there's a bit more force in the struts themselves and the springs as well help open up the initial part of the boot and then the strut takes over and opens the whole way. But it's still at a slow, reasonably controlled pace. Now the other options you can go for is you can go for the Octavia struts modification, which basically gives you a stronger strut from the Octavia boots because the boots are heavier, so they have a stronger strut. So you put them in place of the standard Mark II Leon struts. And then what you can do as well to help you have that initial push at the start is you can change the, where are they? They're up here, sorry. Change the bump stops on here to Sirocco bump stops. Now these ones are just threaded and you fix them in place and they're solid and a wee bit of a cushioned end on them but the Sirocco ones are actually spring loaded as well so what happens is the spring loaded part pushes up the boot initially at the start and then the powerful Octavia struts take over. The only problem I found because I actually had that system on my car before I got these ones what I found was the Octavia struts were so strong that they quite violently lift the boot up which I'm sure a lot of owners will say if they've got them fit to the car they'll actually back that up and say that is the truth and also trying to close the boot is extremely difficult. Two hands sometimes is needed. If not one hand, you need to kind of be over the top of the boot and pushing down as hard as possible to get to the shut. So with these ones, like I said, they open nice and smoothly. It's not too violent at all. It's also a lot less wear and tear on the hinges. And even better is you can just use one hand and you can close it quite easily with just one hand and it's not pushing back too much. And that's it, shut. So, I would say that this version is better than the Octavia version, but that's only because I've had the two to compare them together. Maybe people that have got a larger spoiler on the boot will actually find that the Octavia struts won't be too bad to push shut because they've got the extra weight pushing on the boot at the same time. 
And then one final version of the way you can do this modification is you can retrofit new springs to the internals of the strut that's already on the car. So a guy called Josh, who's got a Mark II Leon, he's actually got two really nice looking Mark II Leons. Uh, he's done this modification, which I'll put on screen just now, where he retrofits these separate springs onto the struts. And what happens is they do the job of this strut here, basically pushing up the boot initially at the start, and then the struts again take over and push the car the rest of the way. And this just involves not having to buy new struts at all, but just buying the wee springs separately, cutting them to size and then sticking them on the original struts. Now, for all these mods, actually, there's one thing in common that when you hold this button on the facelift cars, it will automatically open up the latch itself. But on pre-facelift cars, you usually have to program this button to work like that. So just be aware that if you've got a pre-facelift car, you're doing this modification, you may need to code in this button separately. Now, exhaust systems on this car. Now, you can interchange different exhaust systems from, for different models of car, different engines of car, but just be aware you might need to get reducers to actually go from a smaller diameter pipe on the original car to the larger diameter pipe, say, of a Cupra exhaust system. The one I've got in the car just now is a Cobra system. It's a turbo back stainless system. It's resonated as well. It has still got a fair bit of noise to it, basically. It still sounds quite sporty, but if you're looking for a similar system from, say, Miltec, if it was resonated as well, you'd still get a lot more noise of a Miltec exhaust compared to the Cobra. The Cobra systems can be a lot more muted compared to the Miltec systems. And then when it comes to other exhaust systems for like diesel engines, I think Hornet have been well recommended as well. And if you're looking for a good downpipe for these cars as well, then the Trax Lag downpipe seems to be the go-to one that everyone seems to recommend for all various models of the Mark II Leon. So when it comes to induction kits, there's quite a few options for these cars. Now on my car, I've got this Forge Twin Induction Kit. It's not available anymore, I don't think. I can't seem to find it for sale brand new. You can get them secondhand quite readily, but brand new, I think it's been discontinued. But the most popular options I see just now seems to be the Revo Induction Kit or Revo Induction Kit or the Oversized Ram Air Induction Kit. They seem to be the two most popular induction kits for these cars, whether it's even a petrol or diesel engine. If you want a bit less noise than those ones would give off, then you want to get a racing line induction kit, which is more enclosed, and it just brings the air in the front, but all the actual filters are enclosed inside the housing, so you don't hear as much noise from them. And then Cyclone Performance on Facebook, they do a lot of customizable options. So if you want to go for a certain color theme for your engine bay, then check them out, and you can actually customize the size of the filter, what it looks like, and the pipework as well. So if you want to change out the interior seats of the car, there's a few options for the Mark II Leon as well if you want to upgrade them or make them look sportier if you've got maybe really standard ones in the car currently. Now I've got a list here because I'll forget all these if I didn't have it written down. So there's a Mark V Golf, the Mark II Audi A3, the Mark III Seat Toledo, the Mark II Audi TT and the Mark II Skoda Octavia as well. Supposedly those seats go in here, no bother at all. I'm not sure about the back seats for each of those versions, but definitely the front seats seem to all have the same mounting points in the floor plan, so it's a straight swap, like for like. So we did see some really sporty seats from an Audi A3 that you could just pop it straight in place of your seats in your Mark II Leo. So when it comes to upgrading the speakers in the Mark II Leon, you just need to bear in mind that 6.5 inches is the size of all the speakers in all four doors. Now, if you do get new speakers for these doors, when you take the original ones out, you'll see they've got quite thick housing on them. So you need to buy adapter rings for the new replacement speakers you put back into the doors. These are readily available online if you just type in speaker adapter ring for Mark II Leon and it should come up. So some popular choices of brands that people replace these speakers with are Vibe Slicks, also Ground Zero, Pioneer, Kenwood, GL and Focal, they're the most popular choices people go for. Components would be your next step up, so that would be a separate tweeter and mid-range speaker with a crossover in between. This would give you really good quality sound, but it might not be as powerful as you're wanting because there's still a limitation to the amplifier that's in the head unit on the car itself. So if you've got a standard head unit on the car, there's only so much power it can put out to these new speakers. You can put an inline converter, so this basically converts the signal of the speakers to the two, I think it's RCA outputs, the white and the red output, which then can be wired to an amplifier, and then you can run all your four door speakers off that amplifier if you want more power, or you could just buy an upgrade to the head unit itself, which we'll touch on next. Now for head units, there's quite a few options out there for this car, and Kenwood actually made a genuine VAG replacement head unit for this car a number of years ago. I think it was about a £1,000 actually, so it worked with the steering wheel controls, the parking sensors and everything else, so it was a very good option, but very expensive. Also, Pumpkin and Extrons are well-known brands. People say mixed things about them, some say they're successful, some say they're not, depending on the memory you spec on those ones. So if you are going to buy one of those brands, I recommend you go for the 
bigger RAM sizes in those ones to make sure they run smoothly and respond quickly. People also do the RCD 330 upgrade as well. So that's what another model from a same VAG car, but it's got Apple CarPlay built into it as well. So that's another popular option. And then finally, a way of upgrading the interior in these cars, the trim especially, I would recommend no one other than JH Hydros. I'll leave a link down below to his Facebook page where he does loads of different designs and styles of trim. I've done the centre part of my console so far on my dashboard, but I'm also looking to get the door trims done at a later date as well, and also part of the steering wheel. So I wouldn't recommend anyone else other than JH Hydros, so give him a shout through Facebook if you're keen to do the same yourself. Now talking of interior modifications, if you want to see how I did the door trims on my door cards here, then click this link up here in the corner and I'll take the video where it shows you how to do that. Thanks again for watching as always, hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video, hit subscribe to catch more videos from the channel in the future. I'm off now to get this wee on her lunch. Where are you going? Millie? You saying bye? Bye. <laughs> I'll catch you later. Bye bye. The multifunctional display. Too bright. You want me to close that door? Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay.